Hallelujah. Lord bless my aggravating wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sister Jody's up here trying to concentrate and she's laughing now. She got her some of that Lynn uh, wine there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. In the book of Jude, I just want to briefly capture something here in closing. Jude is right after 3rd John, right before the book of Revelation. Jude is called in verse 1 the servant of Jesus Christ. He's the brother of James. And he's writing to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So the book is to those that's been sanctified, set apart from their sin, preserved in Jesus. Somebody shout, if you don't let him sanctify you, you can't be preserved. Amen. Hallelujah. So, and it's to the called, those that are truly called. Amen. Praise God. And he said, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Verse 3, he said, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to encourage you that you should earnestly contend. Somebody say stand. Fight for the faith which was once delivered unto you as saints. The common salvation means the orthodox, the regular, the, the frequent, the mainstream, um, the most popular, the one that's been accepted, that's traditional even, uh, the established salvation, meaning the Bible, what God says, the common. I've often used that scripture and say we need some common sense. Uh, <laughs> praise God when, when preaching this book anymore hallelujah as well as spiritual sense but and he said this is what I want you to do he said I want you to earnestly that means with a passion I want you to fight for the faith stand for it he said which was once delivered unto you as saints so the original is the common it's the one that was once delivered unto you come on because Jude is letting them know there are many coming just like Paul warned in Acts 20 and 28 when he says, you know, keep yourselves, or take heed unto yourselves, you first. Then, in other words, guard your own heart and then take heed unto the flock which the Lord has made you overseers of that he has purchased with his own blood. And that's Acts 20 and 28 and then 29, Paul said, because there's many coming after me that's going to be like wolves and they're going to come in and scatter the flock. Amen. So he said, and I've warned you day and night with tears that even some among you is going to rise up among you and start denying even the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude's writings is a warning to the brothers, the beloved, to the called, to the saint, even the sanctified. He's letting them know there's a common salvation that's under attack. It's the one that's been established from the cross that the apostles have preached Hallelujah. The only one, and it was the one once delivered unto you as saints. Amen. That changed your life. He, and, and so here we are on this Memorial Day weekend, and he's about to remind them. He's about to bring their mind back. Hey, don't you forget some things. He said, for there are certain men crept. Somebody say the creepers. I call them the creeper preachers. They've crept in unawares. In other words, they've snuck in. They've come in saying just enough of truth, that, but, but then they lace it uh, with some untruths. They give you just enough of truth, but then they lace it with that poison, amen, those lies, uh, and it sounds good because uh, it, it's called the occult. It's called new eggs. It's got scripture laced all in it, but it's taken out of context to mean what it is, what they want it to mean. And he said they're going to come in. He said, who before of old are ordained to this condemnation? Listen what he calls them, ungodly men. Ungodly means they're unlike Christ. They'll preach to you things. Come on, somebody. But in their character and their lifestyle, the way they live, they live loose. They've got a grace now. They can do anything the world's doing. Come on, somebody. And he says what they do is they turn the grace of God, our God, into lasciviousness. That means they turn it into nothing more than a permit or where we get the statement of license to keep on sinning. They make grace sound just that way. 
Amen? Come on. Their message of grace is this. You might be still sinning, but if you'll keep confessing that you're the righteousness of God, eventually you'll become the righteousness of God. They're telling you you can become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. If you'll just confess it, even though you keep sinning, just confess I'm the righteous God. That don't sound like repentance to me. Come on, somebody. God said in Song of Solomon, amen, 7 and 10, he said that godly sorrow produces repentance. Acts 3, 19, the Bible said, repent that you may be converted. Somebody shout, there's no conversion without repentance, and there's no repentance without conviction. So some of these preachers are the ones who are telling us we don't need the law no more. They'll tell you we're not up under the law. Well, Romans 7 and 7 says, uh, amen, God forbid. He said, should we now throw away the law? Amen. He said, no, God forbid. For how would I have known what sin was except by the law? And how would I have known what lust was except the law said thou shalt not covet? So we see Romans 7 and 7 tells us the law. He mentions the tenth of the Ten Commandments, uh, which is thou shalt not covet. The law is first uh, the Ten Commandments. So anytime a preacher stands up and says, we ain't up under the law, we ain't got to have the law no more, they've just right then threw the Ten Commandments out the window. I'm telling you, courthouses have threw it for years out the door. Schools have threw it off the walls. But before that, preachers were throwing it out of the pulpit. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. The law of God is perfect, and it will convert the soul. Psalms 19, verses 7. Now, don't get me wrong, Romans 3. 19 says, to whomever the law speaks, it speaks to those that are under the law. For by the law, no man's justified. But here's what the law does. The law will close the mouth of those that are justifying them own selves and will make their heart, the whole world, guilty before God. Because the knowledge of sin is the law. Without the law, you can't be convicted of what's lawless. That's why we have a bunch of clones in churches today, but not converts. They're considered false converts because they got something on Sunday, but they ain't no different come Sunday afternoon than everybody else in the world is. Hallelujah. Because they've been sitting up under these grace gluttons that are ungodly men that make, whoa, that make the grace of God lasciviousness that makes people subconsciously, whether they say it out loud or not, believe that they can just keep on sinning long as they confess I'm righteous. And somehow righteousness and quitting sinning is a progressive act. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you that devil is a liar. Anybody here Holy Ghost? The law of God does not help you, but it will make you helpless. And what I mean by that, the law says you're a sinner. 1 John 3, 4 says the knowledge of sin is the law. Grace can't be picked up until the law is laid down. Even in our culture today, in communities, there are laws. So we won't be a lawless society. And when you break it, it convicts you. If there's no law, there's no true conviction. And if there's no conviction, there can't be no receiving or acceptance of true grace. Grace don't make no sense apart from the law. How is good news good if I don't know what the bad news is? And the bad news is this. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. But here's the grace of God. Hallelujah. And these blessed God puppets of the devil posing as preachers want to come up and say, well, Jesus, hallelujah, no longer says we're under the law. He's fulfilled it. Yeah, Matthew 5, 17 said he fulfilled it, but he sure God didn't destroy it like some of you are doing. Jesus didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled it. He lived what we couldn't live, but the law is what convicts us that we're ungodly, that we're wretched, that we're wicked, amen, that we are sinful and we need a savior. And if you throw the law away, how do you really see your need for a savior? Because until then, your sin can't be convicted. It's like offering people Good news about a miracle wonder working drug that'll heal you of all your sicknesses, but you don't first know you sick. The law shows me I'm sin sick. 
So these preachers that's telling us we don't need to be preachers preaching the law no more. They've just said, according to Romans 7, 7, because the law, Paul said one of those was, thou shalt not covenant. That's Ten Commandments. Somebody said Ten Commandments. That we don't, really? You, so we don't need to preach Ten Commandments no more. Amen. And some people trying to argue with me the other day. And because and, I'd heard this famous teacher that I called Gone Wild. I've even been in one of those large services of this preacher, this teacher's before, and, and, and well renowned and even respected. But some of the stuff that got to being taught and preached. Holy Ghost grieved so bad, me and I happened on it by accident. I didn't even plan to, because I'm not one of them that scrolls through everybody else's stuff on social media. I just happened to open it up trying to do something else, and there it was. You know how on the home page of Facebook sometimes it just, and there it was, and I saw the title, and so I said, yeah, I know this ministry, so let me see what this. And so, and, and my phone just automatically, I don't know if yours does, hey man, the way I got it set, the, the, it'll just start playing the videos. You ain't got match play. You need to just pull. It. There it goes. And 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 I started hearing what was being preached. And the longer I listen, and I'm not one of them that starts listening to somebody and cuts it off because I got offended. And I said, let, maybe let me listen all the way to the end so I'll know, you know, where they're coming from, what's really going on. But I never felt any different at the end as I did at the beginning. Holy Ghost grieved so deeply inside of me, I began to just moan and groan. Pastor Michael, I had to walk outside. I began to weep. I'd bend over like this and I'd look up, up under the shade tree I was in outside. i just grieve in my spirit and all I could do was pray. Hallelujah. Because see, you got to understand, I've been in this long enough now. There's some of them that I see that's going to the left. Hey man, that's defecting from the faith uh, that was once delivered unto us. I I remember how they used to preach. I remember how what they used to stand for when they weren't nothing and that's why God promoted them like he did because they stood for that was, the, see some of us are looking at large ministries now and hearing some of the junk they're preaching and thinking well look at all the crowds, they still coming. No, they didn't start off a lot of them that way. They were preaching stuff. Hey man, come on somebody rightly divided at the beginning. That's why they grew that's why the blessing of God came. And I know that ministry before it started like this, and that's what I was so grieved about. As I looked up in that shade tree, grieving and praying, I heard the Lord tell me this, and he told it to me from Revelation 13, 13 through 16, about the mark of the beast, the mark. And as I began to look and study, when God spoke that to me, I found out that there is a program, it's not completed yet, but it's coming in the near future, where they will use tattoos that have the technology of Wi-Fi connecting to the internet. In other words, you can get this tattoo on your body and it has within it the ink and all the ability to connect to any Wi-Fi connection and they know where you are, they know everything about you, you. You don't have to pull out no card. You can just walk up and let them scan your tattoo. Because this preacher was preaching that tattoos now somehow in modern Christendom has become an acceptable thing and that it's a good thing and she made it sound like holiness was what makes you happy. Come on, somebody. Well, let me tell you, my friend, there's joy and there's happiness. I, I'm telling you, sometimes to be holy, it may not appear to be the happiest at the moment, but, friend, holiness is not a message of the happier you are, that must be the way God wants you to go. Leave your husband, go find you another, and that if it makes you happy. Come on, all in the name of being happier, and that's what it was. And it was almost a degrading message of those who believe, come on somebody, some old school rules that came from Judaism, amen, that had even incorporated into the Christian church of old, amen, this common salvation, and this, this stuff that the church was founded on, amen, now somehow has changed, and then was all the sad people and the mad people. Come on, and now we're the happier ones because we got grace now, we can do whatever we want want to because we're not up under a law. In Leviticus 19, 28, the Bible says, you're not to print upon your flesh. I'm the Lord. Don't make any markings. And markings or marks or printings is found in Revelation 13 in connection to the mark of the beast. There's going to come a mark. 
So the technology is there, even that mark, not all, but also incorporates tattooing. And the Lord told me this is why there is such a all time now among modern Christian churches, there's a standard let down. Now anything goes. You can wear anything you want to anymore. And none of these things save you. None of these things will condemn you to hell. Come on, somebody. I'm not talking about, it's amazing the people that would attack me and say, you telling me I'm going to hell because I got a tattoo. I never said anything like that in the whole thing. Matter of fact, I actually taught the opposite in there, outlined it very clearly what I was talking. I was comparing it to what was coming for us, the mark of the beast, and this is why there's such a deception that anything goes. Uh, okay, so you can remember some of y'all. You remember the early church. Uh, come on, come on, somebody. Hey, man, none of that stuff wouldn't go. Hello? And I had some say, well, that's the Levitical law. We're delivered from the Levitical law. Well, if you look in Leviticus chapter 19, you'll find you're not to give your daughters to prostitution. You're not to be practicing witchcraft, uh, going to those with familiar spirits. Uh, he even says you're, it's a law. You're not even supposed to lie or swear. The same chap. And some will say, well, well, the scripture right after it says a man wasn't supposed to make his beard round at the corner of his face. Come on. You know what the Lord was doing? He just delivered his people out of bondage in Egypt. In the book of Exodus, he was their savior. He was their deliverer. But by the book of Leviticus, uh, he was the Lord. That's why he said, don't print on your flesh, I'm the Lord. Now, friend, the Levitical law may be over, but he's still the Lord. He's still the sanctifier. Come on, anybody here, that ain't changed. Him saying don't lie. Him saying don't swear. That means curse. Hallelujah. Amen. Him saying don't prostitute. Don't be a whore. Don't sleep around. Don't fornicate. Don't commit adultery. Don't go, amen, and seek those witches with familiar spirits. He's still the Lord. And it's in that same passage. But the reason he told them about trimming their hair and their, not making their head bald and their, and their face rounding it with the beard because... When he brought them out of Egypt, they were in Egypt's bondage the whole time. And the culture there, Egyptians, even Egyptian men would shave their heads. They'd put earrings all over them, pierce themselves all over the place. They would tattoo and print images of their gods all over them. If you've seen any of these tattoos today where the whole person's face is disfigured, they've even changed their, I'm telling you, this stuff comes out of that ancient worship even among the Egyptians. They would print themselves and they'd shave their heads and shave their faces. That's the only reason God, now if you want to shave your face and shave your head or shave your beard, that ain't what that in Leviticus 19 is talking about for today. Come on somebody. But friend, the print on the flesh uh, what he meant then he still means now now if you get a tattoo that don't mean it's going to send you to hell but I'm telling you it ain't pleasing to God uh, and I'm telling you God ain't changed his mind he's the Lord uh, hallelujah if you got a tattoo before you got saved uh, that's the past uh, you're not condemned you've been forgiven come on walk with God uh, but if you still getting tattoos after you say you've come to Christ uh, you've missed the mark seeing we talking about marks you missed the mark and you're deceived have one lady tell me she was decorating her temple. I said, you deceived. Like, hello, like you decorating her house with a new paint job or a new. You, you called it your temple. Wrong is his. This respectable at one time teacher even said, listen what little, little one said. It was quoted from Isaiah 49 and 15 where he's engraving us in the palms of his hand. She said even God has a tattoo of us on his hand. And she was saying she was going to get her one. And the crowds just rejoiced and went crazy. Friend, if Jesus has got a tattoo or a mark on his hand, it's in the form of a print of a spike or a nail. Hallelujah. Glory to God that was driven through his wrist. That's the only marks the Messiah's got. The Son of God's only been printed with. Hallelujah. Yes, we were engraven in the palms of his hand. It was for us that he died on the cross. Pierce my hands and my feet. He said in Psalms 22, 16. I thought, how in the world can you quote that scripture in defense of getting tattoos? Really? 
Have we got that so far out in left field? Yeah, because that's what this grace that Jude warns about leads to. I know preachers right now that preached this stuff years ago, and I felt like a, somebody sticking out like a sore thumb. Hey, Amen. When I'd preach and hear what I'd hear God tell me to preach, you know where some of them are right now? I'm talking about just around this area. They've done left their wives. They don't even got churches. They into so much junk. It's, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You may call me hard and old school. Oh, but I'm telling you, this old-fashioned cross in this old-fashioned common gospel salvation, it'll preserve you. It'll keep you, Jude said. It's what'll sanctify you. It's what'll tell you what's right and what's wrong without a compromise. What? Hallelujah. Listen, I'm trying to close. He said, will therefore you put in remembrance he said, I will therefore that you put in remembrance, Jude, verse five. Somebody shout Memorial Day. He said, I want you to remember something. Listen, he said, though you once knew this, he's telling them, because some of them, Sister Jody's already deceived. Jude's telling them, you used to know this. You used to believe like this, but you're letting these ungodly men, you're letting this new age, me, mine, our gospel come in and tell you nothing's wrong no more. The little clever interjections, you'll hear it in Christian movies, heard it in one not long ago. It says, well, the church is so busy at telling, what, telling everybody what's, what they're against, nobody knows what they're for. That's straight out of the devil's mouth. Don't be deceived. How in the world can anybody know what we for if they don't know what we against? Come on. Because this modern church world is for anything. It don't matter. Do whatever you want to. Just name the name of Jesus. When my Bible says if I name the name of Christ, depart from my iniquity. That's why we got people so deceived. Come on. They're saying we're Christian homosexuals. Ain't no such thing. Come on, anybody here, Holy Ghost. He said, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Afterwards, destroy them that believe not. Verse six, and how the angels were kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, and he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and judgment of that great day. Even Sodom and Gomorrah, verse seven, and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, that sexual immorality, without being married, having sex, and going after strange flesh. Somebody say strange flesh is a man going after another man or a woman sexually going after another woman. Somebody said, that's strange flesh. That's what that's talking about. It's clear. Hallelujah. All right, listen to what he goes on to say. He says, are set forth for an example. These are examples. Suffering the vengeance, somebody shout, the judgment of eternal fire. Verses 12 he said, they are spots in your feast of charity. Love, there's that word love. They're spots in the feast of their love. That's all they want to shout out is love, love. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, they got a love of God without the fear of God. You ain't got both together without the other. Come on, somebody. The love of God, if it don't house the fear of God, it ain't the love of God. Come on, anybody here, Holy Ghost. Clouds that are without water, carried about with winds. That's talking about different doctrines, winds of doctrines. Trees whose fruit withered. Somebody shout, they used to have fruit, real fruit on the tree, but it's withered. Without fruit now, listen to this, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They had fruit, they had roots. Now the fruit's withered, the roots are plucked up. If you're twice dead, that means one time you were dead before you was dead this time. Ephesians 2 and 1 said he has quickened us who were dead in trespasses and sins through Christ. Say with me, before I got saved, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. But then when you came to Christ and surrendered to his lordship, you were born again. Now you're alive. So how in the world can you be twice dead without having at one time point in the past to have been twice born? You had fruit, you had a root. Fruits withered, the roots up, you was dead, then you was alive, now you're dead again, you're twice dead. You know what Jude's telling them? 
There's a doctor floating around telling you there's no, no, no such thing as backsliding. That you can be once saved, always saved. And Jude saying, let me tell you of the once common salvation that was delivered unto you that you once knew. He said, but I want to remind you. And he said, have you forgot when God delivered the people out of Egypt, they turned against him in the desert and he slew them. Come on, somebody. Have you forgot about the angels who rebelled with Lucifer in heaven and God kicked them out and now they're reserved for hell and punishment? Have you forgot about Sodom and Gomorrah? Have you forgot the little short message Jesus preached in Luke 17, 32? He said, here we are on Memorial Weekend. Remember Lot's wife. Have you forgot that Lot's wife in Genesis 19, 26 had left the city limits of judgment? She was with Lot and his daughters. They had escaped, but she turned to look back, and when she did, she was judged with all the sinners of the city and was burnt up. He's painting a portrait of those who believed and then backslid and were lost eternally. Because you can't be twice dead without being twice born. you come to Jesus, you're born again. But when you walk away from him and go back to the sin and go back to the world, your roots plucked up and where there used to be righteous fruit, now it's withered away and now you're twice dead. Don't you ever believe that devil doctrine that says you can get saved and somehow your confession of faith somewhere in your childhood or your past or cause you was baptized and submerged in some water somewhere. Amen. That now you can live any old way you want to the rest of your life. That your salvation is so secure. Well, brother, he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they'll follow me. And no man, I'll pluck them out of my hand and I'll give them everlasting life. I know that's John 10, 27 and 28, but back up to verse 27. Everybody wants to quote verse 28. No man will be able to pluck you out of my hand. I'll give you eternal life. How can you follow a God you don't hear? He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. How can you stay with him if you can't hear him? And if you rebel against what he says from this book, you can't follow him. So guess what? If you ain't following him, you're going in the opposite direction he's headed. It's called backsliding. It's called going in the other direction. Don't be deceived. Today I've come to just preach because we're on this Memorial Day weekend. Jacob was remembered for holding on to God, holding on to the faith. And when I say faith, I'm not just talking about your belief in God. I'm talking about the articles of faith. I'm talking about the word of truth, the principles, the doctrine that the apostles preached. Come on, somebody, the foundation, because there can be no other foundation laid that is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11. Because he said this new kind of grace is denying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us remember Lot's wife. Help us remember what Jude taught. And help us remember Jacob, God. Somebody say, remember. That's the only title I got today. I heard the Lord just said, don't tell my people, remember. That's it. And I want you to see the thief on the cross as you play something soft, Brandon. You can play that first track if you want to. I want you to see the thief on the cross in Luke 23, verses 22. He's telling Jesus, the one that believed, he said, remember me, Lord, this day when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus told him in verse 23, he said, this day will you be with me in paradise. Somebody say, remember me. Say with me, dismembered. I look at that word remember as also a remember me. There's a dismembering going on. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, put me back together. Remember me. The church needs to be remembered. She needs to be put back together. She needs to be put in her place.
And today I've come to tell you remember so he might take this word and remember us. Come on, somebody. Put us in that right order because I'm telling you we're in such a day of deception. People's believing any old thing, anything that makes them happy, anything that feels good, any old wind of doctrine that just blows by that's got a sign and a wonder or a feel good about it. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, Jude cried out to the sanctified, the preserved, and the called. He said, you better remember these things, this common salvation, that that's already been established, not this new stuff coming down the pipe, not these things that tell you, just cause you say Jesus with your mouth, you live like however you want to. Hallelujah, don't be deceived. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude verse 24 somebody say now unto him he's able to keep us from falling he's able to keep us from defecting from the faith but somebody shout now unto him you got to make sure your now is constantly always unto him now unto him tomorrow comes remember now now I must come to him now remember oh Lord help us remember Lord, in this hour where so many are dismembering the faith, they're chopping up the truth. Help us remember, Lord God, the common salvation, the foundations of our faith. For you said, Lord, the foundations be removed, what shall the righteous do? Proverbs 11 and 3. Lord God, have mercy. Oh, what will you be remembered for? Will you be remembered for starting off right but ended up wrong? Holy God, my God, have mercy on us, Jesus. When that song goes off, Brandon, you can put on that uh, We Believe, and I'm going to end with that. Hallelujah. Revelation 2 5 says, Remember from whence you've fallen. Repent. Somebody say, Don't forget to repent. Remember to repent from whence you've fallen. Do the first works. Except I come unto you and remove your candlestick out of its place. Revelation 2 5. I ain't got nobody else to follow me. Presley will. Jesus, Lord, I'm coming. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. If any man puts his hand to the plow and he looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God, Luke 9, 56. If you've put your hand on the plow, Yet you've turned back to the world. God said you won't be fit for the kingdom of God. So with that said, you need to get fit in the faith again. You need to get back in shape. You need to get back in order. Turn back to him. Turn from this world and turn to him. He's coming. You know what that scripture means? That means people can still be doing churchy things, activities, and still be turned. And turned from him. Hallelujah.